supply chain bottlenecks. What are their implications? We're going to learn about it on this episode of Macro Peace Theater. I'm your narrator, Emil Kalinowski, and today's tale comes to us from the faraway lands of Switzerland, where the Bank for International Settlements released BIS Bulletin number 48 on the 11th of November 2021, Remembrance Day, as much of the world remembers, calls it. Uh, it's called Bottlenecks, Causes, and Macroeconomic Implications. We're going to learn about bottlenecks in certain industries, which industries cause bullwhip effects, upstream, downstream bottlenecks, and what are the implications for inflation right now and long term. It's not a very long reading, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but there are lots of graphs, so I do encourage you to actually get a physical copy of it. Okay, let's start. Introduction. As the global recovery gains traction, demand for key raw materials, intermediate inputs, and logistical services has outstripped available supply, leading to rising and volatile prices and delivery delays. The resulting mismatches have put supply chains under pressure, causing bottlenecks that arise when the demand for an upstream production input suddenly and significantly exceeds the maximum amount that can be produced and delivered. Current bottlenecks have persisted longer than anticipated, weighed on output growth, and helped to raise global inflation. This bulletin outlines the sectors subject to bottlenecks, investigates their causes, and assesses their macroeconomic implications. Where have bottlenecks emerged? Recent bottlenecks have been most severe in raw materials, intermediate manufactured goods, and freight transport. For raw materials, prices rose sharply as shortages emerged and firms scrambled to secure supplies, followed in several cases by sudden price declines as production ramped up or demand ebbed. In the manufacturing sector, prices have increased substantially for certain computer chips in high demand, forcing some customers to pause production and others to build precautionary stockpiles to maintain production. Meanwhile, shipping costs have shot up for trade between Asia and North America, and delivery times have lengthened. Ships have been forced to queue for days to access ports, clogging distribution across the supply chain. Truck and air freight prices have also soared, exacerbated by labor shortages. These bottlenecks have had knock-on effects through production networks. Unable to secure inputs, firms slowed or stopped production, causing order backlogs and blowing out delivery times. At the retail level, goods inventories have sunk to historic lows, particularly for durable items such as cars and furniture with high transport costs. In several countries, energy inventories are also at record lows, leading to blackouts and rationing. These, in turn, have weighed on production of raw materials and manufactured goods, intensifying bottlenecks further. Why have bottlenecks appeared, and why are they so severe? Pandemic-induced supply disruptions have clearly been a major cause of bottlenecks, especially in early stages of the global recovery. Producers who had severed relationships with suppliers early in the pandemic found it hard to re-establish them when demand picked up. Asynchronous lockdowns disrupted shipping, while sporadic virus outbreaks led to further dislocations. But there are also other causes. Unexpected natural events have intensified supply pressures. A lack of investment in the years leading up to the pandemic left some industries with little spare capacity. The investment shortfall was particularly severe for oil and resource commodities, due in part to the transportation away from fossil fuel energy. At the same time, rising prices for some items went hand-in-hand with high volumes, suggesting an important role for demand. Prices for many resource commodities surged against the backdrop of stable supply, at least in aggregate which was hardly affected by the pandemic. And semiconductor exports from Asia considerably exceeded the 2019 level, 
in part reflecting trend increases in demand for IT and electronics goods. Meanwhile, ports in the United States and China have been processing a larger volume of shipping containers than pre-pandemic, albeit with considerable month-to-month -month volatility. Several factors have amplified the economic severity of bottlenecks. One is the shift in the composition of demand towards manufactured goods during the COVID recession and recovery. These goods are heavily reliant on inputs from other industries, leading to larger demand spillovers than from a services-led recovery. Manufactured goods and their inputs also tend to be relatively capital intensive, making their short-run supply elasticity low as it takes time to expand productive capacity. As a result, sudden increases in manufactured goods demand can translate quickly into bottlenecks, leading to higher inflation. A second factor is behavioral change on the part of supply chain participants. Anticipation of product shortages and precautionary hoarding at different stages of supply chain have aggravated initial shortages, the bullwhip effect, leading to further incentives to build buffers. These behavioral changes have the potential to lead to feedback effects that exacerbate bottlenecks. In this respect, there are parallels between supply chain disruptions and the liquidity stresses in financial markets. A third important background element is the lean structure of supply chains, which have prioritized efficiency over resilience in recent decades. These intricate networks of production and logistics were a virtue in normal times, but have become a shock propagator during the pandemic. Once dislocations emerged, the complexity of supply chains made them hard to repair, leading to persistent mismatches between demand and supply. Nevertheless, persistent bottlenecks could also prompt corrective behavioral changes over time by providing incentives for investment to expand capacity. Once bottlenecks begin to ease, the feedback loops could operate as a virtuous circle to mitigate the bullwhip effects. In this way, just as bottlenecks have persisted longer than initially expected, their resolution could also follow more swiftly than currently feared. Next section, macroeconomic implications of bottlenecks. Implications for economic activity. Bottlenecks reduce economic activity by constraining the inputs needed to produce goods and services along the value chain. The severity of these constraints depend partly on whether bottleneck, bottlenecks affect items that are upstream, in other words, at the start of production chains, or downstream, closer to the final customers. One measure of upstreamness is the average number of times an item needs to be transformed before reaching final consumers. Using input-output tables, the left-hand panel graph number four plots this measure for each of the 405 industries in the United States. The production of primary commodities such as oil, gas, and metals is concentrated at the start of production networks. Supply bottlenecks for these goods affect the production of many others. Electrical components, such as semiconductors, appear around one-third of the way down the supply chain, while freight transportation typically lies somewhat closer to the final consumer. Bottlenecks in more upstream industries can have particularly large effects. Calculations based on a global input-output matrix indicate that the decline in output due to a constraint on the supply of energy commodities or semiconductors is on average 3.5 to 4.5 the size of the initial impact. Output multipliers for more downstream industries, such as accommodation services, are closer to 2. To put these numbers in perspective, they imply that on average, a 10% contraction in world semiconductor production would reduce global GDP by about 0.2%.
the effects could be larger due to the bullwhip effects arising from behavioral changes and for economies that rely heavily on semiconductors. One analyst estimate suggests that chip shortages could car cut car production in 2021 by 7.7 .7 million units, all else equal, equivalent to 8% of pre-pandemic production. For Germany, where the car industry accounts for 6% of GDP, this would be the equivalent to 0.5% of GDP reduction. Bottlenecks in tradable industries, a feature of the current episode, also have international spillovers. On average, around half of the decline in output due to bottlenecks in energy commodities or semiconductors occurs outside the country of origin. By contrast, the bulk of the impact of bottlenecks in the non-tradable sectors, such as construction, does not spread abroad. Adaptation could reduce the impact of bottlenecks. Substitutes for some bottleneck affected items may be available. For example, rising natural gas prices have already seen some electricity firms increase coal power generation. This suggests that the economic impact of energy bottlenecks in Europe and China may not be so severe and may actually provide income gains for producers of energy products when demand increases. Similarly, some firms have started to use air freight to circumvent shipping delays. Ports in the United States have lengthened their working hours to cope with higher demand. However, substitutes are no panacea and may create their own bottlenecks, as in the examples for coal and air freight. And for some goods, like semiconductors, substitutes may not exist, indicating more persistent effects of bottlenecks for countries with large car industries. Implications for inflation the mechanical effect on CPI inflation from the price increases for bottleneck-affected items has been notable in recent months. If energy and motor vehicle prices in the United States and the euro area had grown since March 2021 at their average rate between 2000, blah, between 2010 and 2019, year-on-year -year inflation would have been 2.8% and 1.3 percentage points lower, respectively. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I sort of messed that up, didn't I? I'm going to reread it again. They're saying basically if, uh, if we didn't have this freakout in energy and motor vehicle prices, how much lower would inflation consumer be in the U.S. and Europe? Let me read it again. If energy and motor vehicle prices in the United States and the Euro area had grown since March 2021 at their average rate between 2010 and 2019, year-on-year -year inflation would have been 2.8 and 1.3 percentage points lower, respectively. That said, once relative prices have adjusted sufficiently to align supply and demand, these effects should ease. Some price trends could even go into reverse as bottlenecks and precautionary hoarding behavior wane. The mechanical effect on CPI could well turn disinflationary during the second phase. The inflationary effect could be more persistent if wage price spirals take hold. Workers may seek higher wages to compensate for the reduction in real wages, and they might get them especially if ongoing labor shortages raise their bargaining power and reservation wages. Meanwhile, a period of higher inflation could bolster firms' pricing power, strengthening the pass-through of costs into prices. And price competition could weaken if the rise in inflation is pervasive across countries, as has been the case, and if global value chains come under strain. The chances of a wage price spiral are higher if inflationary expectations become unmoored. Market and survey-based wage inf Jesus. Market and survey-based inflation expectation measures have increased in recent months alongside tighter bottlenecks, albeit from very low levels in 2020. 
it is challenging to identify how much bottlenecks directly contribute to the recent increase in long-term inflation expectations. Although the pass-through from short-run inflation expectations to its long-run counterpart has increased. The inflation outlook lastly depends on any forthcoming investment required to address the dislocations. While higher investment boost The inflation outlook lastly depends on any forthcoming investment required to address the dislocations. While higher investment boosts demand in the near term, it raises its productive capacity only with a lag. This is a typical pattern observed in commodity exporting small open economies during the resource price booms. And if investment requires specialized equipment that is in short supply, for example, the case of semiconductor plants, it could lead to further bottlenecks upstream. Conversely, if needed investment does not occur, particularly in areas such as the energy sector that are undergoing a significant long-term transition, bottlenecks could become more common, leading to greater inflation volatility. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to this latest episode of Macro Peace Theater. What were the key takeaways? I'm glad you asked because... The authors very conveniently gave us some bullet points. Here they are. Bottlenecks in the supply of commodities, intermediate goods, and freight transport have given rise to volatile price and delivery delays. Number two, there's four of them. Bottlenecks started out as pandemic-related supply disruptions amid strong demand from the global economic recovery, but they have been aggravated by the attempts of supply chain participants to build buffers in already lean production networks, the so-called bullwhip effect. Number three, bottlenecks have been particularly severe in upstream industries, those that supply inputs used in many other products. These constraints have led to large international spillovers through global value chains. And finally, the direct inflationary effect of bottlenecks will likely be limited after relative prices have adjusted. However, sustained inflationary pressures could emerge emerge if bottlenecks persist long enough to trigger an upward shift in wage growth and inflation expectations. That last point is the, is the key, ladies and gentlemen, and that's also why you may have noticed that I started slipping, sliding, and fumbling as if the field I was playing on was covered in snow. Yes, for those of you listening in America, you're thinking, well, he must be referencing that famous Thanksgiving Dallas Cowboys game against the Miami Dolphins where Leon Lett slipped and slid into a loss. Yes, I'm recording this right before Thanksgiving, and so that's on my mind. But I was slipping and sliding at the end of this article. Why? Because I was thinking, well, you know what? This is what I should say at the end. This is the points I should raise. Never think of two things at the same time, ladies and gentlemen, especially if you're a man. Just stick to one thing. Women, obviously, you guys can think of lots of things simultaneously. Okay, so... That's the key. The wage, um, what is it? The If workers may seek higher wages to compensate for the reduction in real wages, the inflationary effect could be more persistent if wage price spirals take hold. Yes, absolutely. And so good people are saying that's what's going to happen. And the Atlanta Fed's wage price tracker does show a surge recently. But... I would suggest that I would be, to you, ladies and gentlemen, that I would be surprised if this happens because we exist, we live in a silent depression. The third worldwide depression of the last 150 years. If we were outside of a depression, then, yeah, I can see wage price spirals taking hold and workers saying, go stuff yourself and give me higher wages. Look what's going on out there. And employers might be willing to do that because they see demand, they see a future economic growth opportunity, return, profit, great. And so, okay, you could see that happening. An alternative scenario would be if we had strong labor unions. We don't. Seems like we're returning. The pendulum is swinging back towards that. But labor unions are very weak. I have seen strong 
recent be strength. I have seen strength coming from labor unions, not necessarily in wages, but with respect to the uh, the whole COVID pandemic, you have to take this medication slash vaccine. And some unions are telling their employers, go stuff yourselves. And some of these employers are saying, e you know what, uh, we're going to back down. So I'm seeing some strength on that front. And I believe the pendulum is swinging back long term. I'm thinking generation, you know, but I'm not seeing wage price spirals as very likely in a depression. The employers aren't going to be there's lots of other people that are outside the labor force they could hire. They don't have the profit. They're not going to pay higher wages. It's unlikely, I believe. I would be surprised. Let's see if I'm wrong. Another item they say, something that I've always believed in. They say the chances of wage price are spiral if inflationary expectations become unmoored. I have always believed that if inflationary expectations rise, then that have some sort of self-reinforcing, self-fulfilling um, pro prophecy property whereby then inflation might indeed come true. But as Jeff Snyder and I recently discussed on a recent episode, that may not be the case at all. That just may be an assumption, an easy, implicit assumption that has no economic data behind it. And I'm not just speaking out of my rear sector. This has come straight from a Fed researcher, which we discussed in our, in one of our episodes. I'm sorry, I don't remember which, which one off the top of my head. But you'll find the links in the show notes to this podcast. And that researcher, using unvarnished language, ladies and gentlemen, unvarnished. It was not academic speak. It was something you would hear at a gentleman's club or a bar. And he said we assume this is true and we've assumed this is true for a long time. Why? Where's the data? We just assume the sun and the planets rotate around the earth because it seems that way. But have you thought about it? Have you done the research? Is this for certain? Are you sure? Because I don't think so. Unvarnished. Unvarnished. He came right out and it was quite a, quite a paper. Anyhow, the point being, Yes, if a wage price spiral and inflationary expectations happen, then maybe inflation will stick. Uh, but maybe inflationary expectations don't matter in terms of setting, determining future inflation. And the wage price spiral isn't going to happen in a depression. But this last part here about, well, what if these bottlenecks continue because... We've built our global economy around efficiency and not resiliency. And why would we build it around resiliency? The future is bright. Globalization is going to continue forever. It's the end of history. Everything's going to be wonderful. We believe in the gods of the marketplace. Why, why would we build, build resilience? That costs money. What are you, an idiot? So, but that's perfectly natural. Uh, it comes in cycles. We were simply at that cycle point where we had gone too far. It's nothing to complain about. It's what we always do gener in long, multi-generation cycles. So we may have continued consumer price increases due to inefficiency. No, uh, lack of resiliency. But Jeff Snyder now would say that's not going to continue that's going to come out of economic activity. It's not like people are gonna say, well, my banana costs $10, so I'm gonna buy that banana and continue spending like I usually do. No, Jeff says, the economy stinks. If the banana costs $10, that $9 increase for a banana, I don't know what a banana costs, ladies and gentlemen, is gonna come out of other economic activity. And so he's, he believes that not even, not even supply bottlenecks will be persistent in the sense of keeping uh, consumer prices elevated. He, believe, he believes in certain segments, yes, prices will remain elevated for those supply demand imbalances, but they will be compensated for by economic actors saying, I can't afford this $10 banana. I love banana. I got a cramp in my thigh. I need it. 
and I'll just take it out of my $9 Starbucks coffee. All right, enough, ladies and gentlemen. You've now had a, you've now seen, well, I've seen a little insight into the life of a podcaster living on $10 bananas, $9 cups of coffee, and rubbing their thighs because they've got a cramp. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Well, by the time you hear this, I hope you've had a happy Thanksgiving, and I hope you're enjoying that delicious rye bread open face sandwich with the cold turkey, Dijon mustard, and maybe some cranberry. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of that cranberry stuff. Oh, yeah. 